Good evening. A warm welcome to the program Economic Forum. My name is Tawanda Gudlanga. This week we are focusing on agribusiness and uh, the impact that it has on the country moving forward. It has generally been known that Zimbabwe is an agro-based economy, but the vagaries of climate change have uh, really uh, dampened the spirit uh, of uh, agricultural practice in the country. Two successive droughts have hit the country, affecting livestock and crop. And uh, what even became worse is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has had its uh, uh, debilitating effect on the industry. But of course, we seek to understand how we can, as a country, move forward during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond in agriculture. My guest is Mr. Samson Chauruka. He is a farmer at Shamiso Farm, which is about 25 kilometers outside of the capital city, Harare. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, Tawanda. Now, let's talk about um, agriculture, maybe from a holistic perspective. How has it been the past 40 years? Well, it has had its ups and downs, uh, in particular, well, at Independence, where black farmers started to come in through the land reform system, which was being done uh, by the government, finding farms and buying. And obviously, farmers were slowly getting into production, and there was too an old colonial system, which remained basically intact and taking control of the agriculture. But fast forward into 2000, with the land reform, you see a proliferation of black farmers into the commercial mainstream, but without proper systems being put into place. As you are aware, it was a fast-tracked system, more on the political lines rather than on the economic lines. So yeah, we had really a mixed bag of results, like if you look at tobacco, if you look at sugar cane, if you to look at some cereal crops, depending on whether it was a drought year or a rainy season, you would find that results are really not uh, collated properly or in a correct uh, upward trend because it's a hit and miss uh, because there is no deliberate framework which helps the farmers to get into a productive, structured manner on how to, to grow the the, the, the economy. Let's look at the hits and misses, starting with the hits. Well, like I said, tobacco is doing much better because to a large extent it was private sector with some support or the opening up of the framework uh, to allow a lot of uh, uh, farmers to get into and be contributory. But the small outgrower schemes, which were a plethora of them which were across the country, helped to actually increase productivity, to increase quality, as smaller pieces of land are easier to tend, and if managed properly, you get better in yields and more quality. So you actually get a communal farmer in Karoi producing more than 3,000 kgs per, per, per hectare, and also good quality because they had a follow-up outgrower schemes, which were, to a large extent, uh, financed and run by indigenous uh, entrepreneurs who saw opportunities in it. You see in Apple Valley the smallholder um, sugarcane farmers because they are leveraging off more experienced and um, structured framework have done very well and you look at the chicken and now you see what we are trying to do in the piggery and got uh, production systems um, where we are actually putting up deliberate frameworks, new ways of thinking, new ways of reorganizing the farmers so that productivity can actually go up. And but the misses? Maize, for example, it's a really sad one because when we do get to be productive, you have farmers who have gone into the above 10 tons per hectare uh, yield spectrum but there has not been a deliberate framework to make sure that the consistency is achieved or the quality of productivity uh, goes in. We don't need huge hectares to go through uh, with 
enough maize to feed the country. What we need is a deliberate frame, framework where we make sure that certain farmers year in, year out, are able to achieve the correct yields and make sure that the best cereals are available. The soya is a disaster. The wheat has been a disaster because we were somewhere, somewhere we were almost there in terms of getting reasonable yields, but because of lack of consistency in policy framework and in application has made us go down to unreasonable yields. Talking about um, the historical uh, nature of our um, agricultural business, as it were, uh, what do you think is the lowest hanging fruit? We think uh, small livestock, in particular things like goats, because of the growing demand internationally and our indigenous people having been exposed to their growing, what we actually need is just the harnessing and increasing in reasonable portions the productivity per farmer. We can easily do the same as we did in tobacco because obviously the, the, the turnaround periods for the gods to get pregnant and to, to give birth, and if we can increase new genetics and so on and mix with the local indigenous gods, there we can easily get the, the high numbers. Obviously there's the poultry and the pigs. If we can make sure that the farm get prices to the farmers are reasonable, and if we can make sure that we cluster the farmers to leverage each other and make sure that they actually become participants along the value chain before within the productivity, produ actual production and beyond the production in terms of the handling, the slaughter, the cold storage, the marketing. And if the farmers, if it makes sense to the farmers, if they can get a reasonable return, definitely all the infrastructure which is lying idle can get back within a short space of time. Join us after the break as we explore the syndication model that Samsung has written and has started to implement. Join us then. Welcome back. We are focusing on agribusiness and my guest is Mr. Samson Chauruka, a local farmer who has developed a syndication model in order to capacitate farmers and of course allowing them to enjoy each and every process in the value chain. Now tell us more about um, the, the syndication model that you came up with. Syndication model just uh, is looking at bringing farmers together at the local levels so that the skill sets, the incubation of the smallholder farmers or those who don't really know much about the processes of enhancing their productivity, looking at issues of standardization, looking uh, at issues of uh, synergies, looking at issues of training, issues of uh, knowledge gaps and putting them together so that as we look at the various stages of the value chain of production, we are able to put together and marry together farmers, those who know, those who are at a slightly higher level, and those who don't really are at the beginning, can maximize their knowledge and their abilities to make sure that at the local level, we are able to create micro economies which are supported by the legislative framework, which are supported by other farmers who are knowledgeable, or the processing and the value addition of their products to make sure that the farmers are the people who tell their own stories so that they are able to maximize value out of their enterprise at the individual level, at the group level, and at the corporate level. 
But uh, how different is it from any other a scheme or model that already has been put in place because you are talking about believing in numbers and we've seen farming cooperatives being set up we've seen uh, incubation hubs being uh, set up as well how different is your model from some of these uh, that are already uh, in place obviously the syndication model looks at the failures of for example what you mentioned the cooperatives where politics of the numbers becomes the downfall of the group, even if they were successful. You look at the issues of donor funding, where it was about sustainable livelihoods rather than about economic emancipation of the farmers. The minimum levels of productivity expected at the individual unit. So what we are looking at in syndication, we are putting beyond just the production issues, but looking at an economic framework which makes sure that the key success factors required of the farmer to make sure that they maximize their enterprise or their profitability are incalculated into the production process at the various levels. This is looking at the individual unit and putting them together in groups at their various levels until we come up together with a cluster which is functional, which is a basis of putting an industry together. We are wanting to make sure that the farmers become real participants in the key economic areas of their production. But are they not participants if they are beneficiaries? of programs. Let's talk about um, the uh, command agriculture uh, program or command livestock program. Um, there are also other programs with development partners to uh, ensure that there is sustainable livelihoods. There are also other uh, various uh, ways that uh, a government and other development partners are ensuring that uh, that is actually uh, reached. No, I think the key difference with the main government programs which have come in and failed ultimately is because people are receiving without putting benchmarks to make sure that they retain that which they get to make them be capacitated to move to the next level of production. Like I said, the syndication model is premised in commercialization of the smallholder sector filling up the knowledge gaps which those farmers have, but training them to standardize to a minimum level acceptable at international uh, standards of productivity per unit. Or if it's a pig, the farmer is able to make sure that he is able to match the minimum performances expected for them to make a good return. At the same time, we are taking out the elements of entitlement, of uh, nepotism, we are taking off the element of politicization and making sure that those who deserve to get the support, those farmers who have the propensity and the potential to produce and to be effective are supported and make sure that they have got a leveraged position and working beyond just their own unit. Right now you get some farmers do very well, but they don't have the knowledge about the markets, the value is taken away at the slaughter level or at the holding level with the cold chain. But we are giving those farmers who excel an opportunity to become participant or participants along the value chain and get residual income from their enterprise, not just for them to be logged out at the farm gate uh, price or at the farm level. We want them to be the writers of their own success. Now, as a part of the writing of success, there have been mixed reactions with uh, a model such as contract farming. I, I, I remember uh, watching something even on uh, in America where some contract farmers have had serious, serious uh, challenges. Um, how different is this from contract farming if you are talking about commercializing the smallholder? In Zimbabwe in particular, the said thing in, about contract farming has actually been about exploitation, where there is a minimum fixed return to the actual farmer, where they just get enough to make sure that they can come back and produce again. 
but not looking at their actual success and also sharing in the bigger cake. As you, you, you are aware, the actual production is the lowest net profit return center in a value chain approach to production. More profit might be made at the commodity side, at the feed side. The actual produce, production makes the minimum return, but like here in Zimbabwe, at the slaughter, at the wholesale, and at the retail side, sometimes you're actually having that portion where they actually don't put a lot of phys much of the physical effort, but they are making three, four times than the actual farmer who is uh, keeping the animals. So what we are trying to do is to look at a balanced scorecard and say, how do we transfer the profits to be made along the whole value chain to make sure that at the individual sections of the production, we enable them to partake in future production or enhanced production, but they also get a fair share of the profits. Zimbabwe has largely been a primary uh, commodity producer, even in agriculture. How can we move out of that uh, scenario moving forward? Join us in the third and final segment. Welcome back to the third and final segment of Economic Forum where we are looking at agribusiness with of course a particular focus to a syndication model that is believed to be uh, one of uh, the ways that farmers, particularly smallholder farmers, can begin to enjoy uh, fruits of their labor across the entire value chain. And my guest is Mr. Samson uh, Chauruka. Now, you were talking about having to enjoy uh, some level of success or profitability across uh, the value chain. Um, some will say this sounds really uh, mythical. It cannot happen. Do we have the framework that does allow the farmer to actually enjoy across the entire value chain, particularly in livestock? Yeah, this is where the syndication model again seeks to address in a significant way. We want to get away from the case of the resource-rich nations, where people become just the primary uh, producers without actually moving to the secondary and tertiary elements, or the comfort zone of saying, we all have, but we don't need to do that. As you are aware, some of the most successful economies in the world don't actually have resources, but they know how to value aid resources provided for other people. And for the syndication model, it is a significant part to make sure with the development partners we have come in with, in particular for the pig and goat value chains already, is to make sure that we leverage off the more successful small to medium farmers and capacitate them, fill up that financial gap, the capex gap, which was required in order for them to do those other processes beyond their own production to make sure that they are able to go forward along the value chain in terms of the slaughter facilities, the feed manufacturing facilities, also congregating the small butcheries around the country into more efficient ways of doing things so that we create a retail aspect so that we are addressing both the input side and the out of taker side of, of things. And then the smallholder farmers who lack the resources in a broader sense are able then to be incubated and mentored to get the necessary experience to see the big picture. That's where the process of standardization come into place where the bigger farmers are able to get into things like artificial insemination, for example, which we are already putting up for the pig production side creating the gene pools for them to be able to come at the local level to access high quality genes for their livestock and then be able to be supported to standardize the production process. And then also for them to create their own institutions, associations, trusts, foundations, which then work with the government to create a regulatory 
framework which is sensitive to their own needs. And therefore, we are giving them a voice, a combined voice at the local level, so that the authorities within their own communities can tailor make the national policy framework to be able to better support them to be protective. But are farmers protected from the realities of monopolies, oligopolies? Because um, this has one, been one of the, uh, uh, the major factors affecting uh, productivity at a smallholder uh, uh, level. That's where, again, the syndication address, uh, model addresses the concept of contract growing, which had been abused in this country, where the big monopolies would enjoy the subsidies from the government and so on and things like that, and not then put them down to the farmers themselves who are producing to them. And they were actually making sure that the farmers take the bad end of the stick, they take all the risk, they take all the, 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 the access their resources at no subsidies at all. What we are saying, Smallholders, if put together in a commercial framework, a well-run organization, are able to sit at the big table because they then congregate and get the numbers and the volumes of their raw materials required for their production. And instead of one farmer coming and saying, I want two tons of maize or one ton of soya uh, from the government subsidized, we are now having a thousand com farmers coming in and requesting similar volumes to that what the monopolies were, 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 were getting, and also requesting to say our members, because we are processing at the correct level, we are accounting for our uh, production, we are accounting for our revenues, and therefore contributing to the tax bracket, and more importantly, the financial inclusivity, inclusivity which comes with being together. The farmers are now able to profile themselves in able to access cheap money, which in the current circumstances would go to the same big monopolies to make them even stronger to exploit them. But when they are congregated together, we are creating a common voice which then be, um, can make them be able to create the guarantees, the necessary uh, environment to be able to access finance, to be able to be recognized, to be able to be contributors to the economy. As you are aware, 65% of our people work in agriculture. But in the current scenario, that is where our biggest tax base should be. But for us under syndication, we are actually saying each company or each individual unit has to be registered, have to conform to the laws, have to be contributed contributing to the fiscals in a way which makes them be entitled to the same subsidies like any other um, major industry. So as we wrap up, uh, uh, Samson, you mentioned something to do with funding because one of the biggest uh, challenges is access to funding, particularly on the part of the smallholder farmer. Um, is there a strategy that has been put in place for them to be able to access this money? Under syndication model, that was a very pertinent question we were looking at. And initially, we have managed, because we wrote a robust model which speaks to the farmer and the interests of the farmer, we have fortunately accessed money under the EU funding, round of funding for livestock, under the Zimbabwe Agricultural Growth Program. And again, an essential part with the new dispensation you find that the Minister of Agriculture and the technocrats are taking an interest to understand the nitty gritties of the economics of agriculture. And we had the Zimbabwe Agricultural Program. Because the farmers are being selected on a transparent manner, we are now able to access that kind of funding. But going forward, we need to create a revolving fund, which is self-sustaining and allowing new farmers to be coming in. And under the model we have done, we are saying we are going to create a revolving fund or a sovereign fund. And fortunately, because we've got people who believe uh, in the program, the more bigger smallholder farmers or small mid to medium enterprises who are becoming the anchors, they have agreed to match funding a matching program with the EU funding coming in where they actually contribute their own funds 
to make sure that they create a strong base. Mr. Samson Chauruka, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Welcome. My guest was Mr. Samson Chauruka, a local farmer who developed a syndication model which has been adopted by the European Union in collaboration with the government of Zimbabwe through the Ministry of Agriculture. We've come to the end of the program. Do join us again next time. My name is Tawanda Gudlanga. It's pleasant viewing.